Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. We've got a, a great uh, session ahead of us. Um, we've got two uh, wonderful guests joining me in Jamie Osborne, who is the uh, CEO of Shift, previously Get Capital, and also James O'Donnell, the Managing Director of Open Analytics, as I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, our, um, our resident data guru and BRI expert. And we've got it slightly differently this month, with, which, is really, um, which is really exciting. Obviously, we'd normally do our business risk index, but we're going to combine that with our most recent um, white paper with, that we put out or, or document we put out, Outlook 2022, Australia's phantom lockdown threatens sustained economic recovery. And there is plenty going on at the moment, as there has been for two years, it feels like every time we um, start to get some some fresh air and some forward momentum, um, something else pops up, unfortunately. And, and of course, we're going to talk about that and how that's you know affecting the outlook for the rest of the year. And we will, of course, look into the BRI stats that we usually do. James will take us through that in sort of the second half. So strap in and, and get ready for a great show ahead. Um, so I think to touch on Outlook 2022, if you haven't downloaded it, please jump onto creditorwatch.com.au on the homepage there. There is a, um, a, a button um, or a badge that you can click on to download Outlook 2022. We've got a fantastic bunch of contributors in that um, from all, um, all walks of life and industry and experience giving their two cents um, as well. I think, you know, to, to touch on the, the, the phantom um, COVID lockdown that we're talking about, obviously no one in actual lockdown, but certainly people slowly coming back into the CBD, back into offices, um, getting back into a normal routine. But really we're seeing, you know, a lot of people holding back, you know, and it, you can look at it from a regional perspective, you can look at it from an, an industry perspective. And I think importantly as well, you can look at it um, from an age perspective, you know, that younger generation, um, more willing to take risks, obviously, and go to nightclubs and not worry about, you know, potentially catching COVID, whereas the older generation is certainly taking their time and, and being much, uh, much safer, I would suggest, um, on the whole, in terms of, you know, where they're going out and, and what sort of exposure they're, um, they're potentially, they're potentially um, getting, to, getting when they are, when they go to, you know, hospitality venues or, or out to, you know, people's places and whatnot. So that's certainly, it's certainly, I wouldn't say threatened, maybe th threatened that you could use earlier on in the year, but it seems like we're, we're getting a little bit more confident and, and venturing out more and more, but it's certainly going to hurt the, the, the economic recovery and the speed of that economic recovery. Um, the good thing is that businesses and consumers are certainly cashed up. They're ready to spend and, and, and ready to invest. Um, obviously, it was a little bit slower with Omicron coming along. Um, and of course, the supply chain issues that, that, are, that are hurting a lot of industries and, and don't really show any signs of easing up at the moment. So I think, you know, the recovery is there, which is great. And there's some already numbers coming out from, from various, um, you know, various publications and, and banks and, and government as well to, to suggest that that recovery is certainly on the way. It's probably just a bit slower than, than we expected. Um, and I guess the big question is, you know, how are, how are small businesses faring and, and Creditor Watch has got fantastic data to talk about, which, um, which James will get into. Um, and I'll also be able to pick James' brain and also Jamie's brain as well. So the forefront of, um, of SME lending um, with Shift. So I think the big thing that still exists in the economy that is, you know, we hear about all the time when we did a when we did a survey last year, it was probably the number one thing that was holding back investment and 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 positive, you know, outlooks. And that's that's certainty or uncertainty in this case. You know, when are we going to be able to invest higher? You know, spend with confidence that. Um, you know, we'll see either a return on that or we won't, you know, end up back in a, um, back in a lockdown. And of course, we, all, we also have the looming federal election, um, which seems to be, you know, seesawing both ways. And then, you know, various events happening that, you know, seem to suit one party or one leader over another. Um, and of course, we will see an increase in, in, in solvencies as normal um, collection activities return, particularly from the ATO and also the banks who have who have held back that final, you know, that final tool that they have in their tool belt, which is you know putting a putting a company into administration in order to try to get a return 
um, uh, which is often, to be honest, cents in the dollar, but they are certainly still holding off on that, which is, uh, which is a good thing. Um, however, it cannot happen forever. We know that we need to get back into a normal collection rhythm. So with that in mind, um, James, Jamie, welcome. Great to have you on board. It's a longer intro than I probably expected, but there's plenty to get through at the moment. So uh, thank you, Jen. And, and what Thanks, I might do to, to, uh, to kick off is, is just ask some questions about, you know, what are we seeing out there or what are you seeing in, in the market, um, whether it's industry, region specific or just small business versus, versus large business. Uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, just a general sense of what you're seeing at this stage, and then I might get into some more specific questions if that's uh, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, you talked about that sort of layer cake of uncertainty, right? There's a lot going on. We're on the hopefully the tail end of COVID, but you've got geopolitical risk, you've got an election, you've got floods, you've got all sorts of things. It's um, there's just a lot of uncertainty there. And, you know, we called quite early in COVID uh, what we thought would be the recovery phase for small business as K-shaped. So think of the two legs of the K, an up trajectory and a down. And that absolutely played out through 2020 and 2021. So if we, if we look at the data on our own portfolio, on our own customers, um, and we have live data on that, right? So we have all of our customers are actually connected through a live bank feed and we actually ingest that data on a weekly basis. And, and that's really the heartbeat of our customers and our portfolio. So we kind of get to read it live. So we absolutely saw that play out. And so the way we think about it um, through our lens is there are just huge differences even within industries and within geographies. So, you know, you, I think you lose a lot of information looking at the averages. You know, you, you hear this tripe sometimes, you know, construction industry looks stretched or regional Australia's in, in trouble. But I think you do need to get down, particularly in SME land, to individual businesses because we see big winners and big losers. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, the first point. I think the second point, and you touched on it, Patrick, some of the data coming out of particularly the banks is very similar to what we see. Liquidity is actually pretty good. Uh, through our lens, liquidity is a really big um, determinant of performance, credit performance. And the governments did a really good job of propping up that liquidity through COVID. That certainly tapered off, but as we look across the portfolio, it's still quite strong. Uh, so that gives us uh, uh, you know, confidence at that portfolio level. Uh, but then the final point, maybe before I hand over to James, you know, you touched on confidence, Patrick, you know, and, and I think that's the anecdotal bit. Whilst we're seeing reasonable levels of liquidity, those businesses that um, are in the position to take advantage of the current environment and to grow aggressively, you know, they're not, we're not seeing them fully put the foot on the accelerator right now. There's just, you know, can we get through you know, back in December it was COVID, now it's the floods and, and, and maybe next month it's, uh, it's the election. So there's certainly still a little bit of a pause that we're seeing uh, in the economy. Yeah, how do we extract that 300 or however many billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that's just sitting in, uh, in, in low yield saving accounts? James, what are you seeing? Yeah, so look, I would just repeat some of the comments there around sort of there's definitely cash and liquidity out there, but again, Yes, uh, at an aggregate level, if you look at the countrywide, the average savings of, of businesses is up. But as Jamie said, there's winners and lo losers. So certainly professional services have got plenty of cash in the bank and actually have done well out of COVID. Um, but if you're a, kind of in the retail trade business or, or hospitality or, or your small business is underwater, then, then you're in not, not so good shape. So I think uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there, but I think over the, you know, over the year, um, I think we'll, we'll tend to see, uh, I'm sort of hoping for a muted and sort of slow recovery overall, but I think there'll be some regions and industries that really struggle um, on the kind of touching on the, the, the flood affected areas. I think that'll be actually quite complex how that evolves. Um, I think in the short term, um, I know that banks will be very, weary to step in and start enforcing on a you know 
regions sort of hit by floods. So the ABAs, of course, um, announced that there'll be more sort of payment holidays. So I think what you'll actually see in the data is that um, business insolvencies in those impacted regions in New South Wales and Queensland will actually, you know, insolvencies will go down, but I think sort of longer term, you you will see businesses lost as a result. Yeah, and that's a good one, the, the data. And I think Jamie, we, you know, you're, you're a technology business, but also obviously in, in lending, it'd be, it'd be great to sort of talk about um, the data side of things. Obviously there's been a huge amount of, um, technological um, advancement and adoption over the last few years, um, particularly in, you know, in the financial services industry, but I think in, in business in general, you know, Australian business owners and managers have, sh have shown they can be extremely um, innovative and, and resilient and, you know, they've been forced to, to find efficiencies within their businesses. Um, so sort of two, two sort of lenses on this. You know, I think the one thing that you learn when you operate in, in the SME world is that there's actually a really, really big difference between an S and an M. And then when you operate in SME world with the lending lens on, um, there's, there's an even bigger difference, right? Particularly if you're a you know, small business trying to get funding from a, from a big bank. So, so maybe just um, touch on, you know, what that looks like for, for small businesses in particular, you know, how do they, how do they get access to, to, to funds? And, and is that more difficult at the moment when they're, when they're smaller? And, and also I like the touch, we touched on sort of data versus emotion as well in making those decisions. Yeah, sure. So let me take the data technology part of that question first. So you're absolutely right. I think small, medium sized businesses, frankly, pretty good at adoption of technology. And if I kind of look back at our journey, um, I mentioned up front, you know, a live bank connection to, to all of our customers. That was that was really the early adopters back in 2018, 2019, and now it's very much mainstream. And frankly, COVID has, has helped that. There's been, in our view, a pulling forward uh, of the future and everyone, uh, is used to checking in digitally now, both in their you know personal lives and, and, and increasingly in their business as well. So uh, we've seen a step change in that adoption and the um, comfort level with you know signing up in, in, in a digital way. Um, that in our mind is really really important for those seeking credit because the incumbent or legacy ways of underwriting a business don't work particularly well for a small business. You've got personal accounts blended with business accounts. You've got um, financial statements that are nine months old or in some cases 18 months old or don't exist at all. And so the assessment process is quite complex and the bank transaction data and you know some of the data that you produce, uh, Patrick, at Credit Watch is invaluable to, to actually getting a finger on the pulse of the business and, and working out those that um, you know, have have those fundamentals that can support you know the credit going forward. So um, that's the first bit. The second bit of your question is it is it harder or easier? Um, look, I think the answer is for the very small businesses, your S, uh, it, it's always been hard. And so I think you know our our message for financiers, you know, our peer group is that you need to look at it in a different way, uh, which is what I've just sort of talked through. Medium sized businesses for those that are growing and have good positions in their market, you know, I think there's reasonably good flow of credit in the marketplace. Now we can split between how the banks might do it and the requirement for equity in your property or how some of the more innovative lenders, you know, look at it. But for the most part, I think there's, there's de decent liquidity. I think the issue we have in these periods of high uncertainty, and you touched on it, Patrick, with the difference between the story and the narrative and the data, is that there's this um, bias to latch hold of the, the narrative. And at the moment, there's a lot of narratives, right? You know, so we were talking just before we got on to this call, there's a lot of people at the moment talking about, gee, construction industry looks tough. Um, the supply chains look tough. Um, you know, fixed price contracts, what is that going to do? Now, you know, that, that is a narrative and there's probably some truth to that. 
on the flip side, you know, there's a bunch of other narratives that talk around the rebuild of southern Queensland after the floods and northern New South Wales. So, so there's a couple of different opposing narratives there. For us, we rely on the data, and the beauty is that data is now live and real time. It's not dated. It's not six months ago or 12 months ago. We get to see live transaction flow of a business today and to be able to make you know, credit decisions and payment decisions based on that data. And I think that's really, you know, really important uh, in order to serve, you know, particularly the the S end of that SME group. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, I'll, Jamie. I'll, I'll just say, um, um, I think at, at the moment, it's probably the, one of the toughest time ever to interpret data. So one of the challenges that a lot of our sort of customers have is, well, what, what does the data mean? <laughs> so I think, you know, if you look at sort of raw numbers like, oh, what are the default rates on bank loans and, and things like that, they're the lowest they've ever been. And but I think there's a general consensus, well, that's artificial. So what's the what's the real story? And then I think people, you know, revert to their gut feel and, and, and narratives is is a, is the way I see it. Yeah. And and James, you've got sort of really good exposure, obviously, you know, you probably know it. Credit Watch's data better than Credit Watch does, but also you, you're working with, you know, big four banks, fintechs, you know, and, and everything in between. You know, what, what, what's the sort of uh, message or, or appetite from an outlook perspective that, that, that they see and, and what do you see? Yeah, so I think it, it sort of varies by different um, organisations. So I know the, the major banks are quite cautious at the moment. Um, so particularly, for example, in construction, you know, looking at their sort of LVR limits and that sort of thing. And in some sense, that worries me a little that if banks sort of tighten credit because um, of because of fear, then that actually can have a negative effect on, you know, the construction industry and all the subcontractors in it. So we know that a lot of contractors in, in construction take a while to get paid typically, but if sort of banks sort of tighten the screws on lending, that could be an issue there. Um, yeah, I, I've got to be honest myself, I have sort of mixed sort of um, on that sort of topic around sort of is it going to be good or bad. The construction industry is a perfect sort of case where, you know, on looking at some data, it looks quite bleak. But um, as Jamie said, uh, yeah, the, the floods will need quite big government investment and big construction projects. So I think eventually there that actually could be a lifeline for that industry. Um, the other thing is that sort of even credit policies need to be re-looked at. Um, so, you know, before COVID, if you went to get a small business loan and you sort of showed your balance sheet and said, well, I made a loss of 5% last year, can you give me a million dollar business loan? You know, the, there'd be a credit policy that something of the, you know, around sort of profitability to a benchmark to get a, to get a loan. But if you look at it, sort of, if I'm running a business that made a 5% loss over the COVID period, that's actually probably pretty good. <laughs> so I think one of the, the biggest challenges at the moment is sort of understanding how to interpret the data. Yeah. And, and Jamie, you're, you're quite positive about the, uh, the future, the outlook? Look, I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a mixed bag. And, and maybe just to hop, pick up on James's point, you know, here's the real data in our portfolio. If we look at just the construction segment, the top quartile is doing about 75% better than they were 12 months ago. And the bottom quartile is doing 50% worse. And, and if we average, average that out, they're doing about the same. But there's some very different experiences in there, you know, at the, at the individual company level. And I think that's, my story of being optimistic, which is for those businesses that have set themselves up for an environment that is uncertain and that they can both mitigate the risk on the downside of that uncertainty, but probably more importantly, take advantage of the opportunity on the upside. You know, we're actually quite positive. Um, for small businesses more generally, for the most part, they're reasonably well positioned to play in that uncertain environment, meaning they tend to be more nimble. Um, they should be able to move quicker. They've got an antenna up for where the opportunity is that maybe the incumbents or the larger businesses don't. So, so that's all that's all positive. Now, um, having said that, back to my liquidity point, you know, these businesses for the most part, you, you do need on the downside that buffer. And that's either in the form of 
some equity or some access, preferably equity, frankly, or, or access to some funding that lets you, you kind of ride through the business cycle. Um, we, we've had an artificially propped up environment now for 24 months. We're going to get back into a business cycle. And so um, uh, those businesses that are well attuned to that, I think, should do very well. Yeah, good point. And the you know, government spend is enormous and it doesn't really feel like it's going to slow down either. There's, there's an argument to be said that it's, you know, it's a Liberal government in charge and a Labor government spending. So um, I think that that obviously bodes well for, for the future and it's kind of thrown on, you know, thrown the sort of traditional thinking about government spend and, and you know, what percentage of GDP should we be, um, be, be spending and, and what should our debt levels be. That's all been thrown out the window and it's, I don't know if we'll ever go back to you know where we were previously. To be honest, um, obviously, any government's going to be working back to that, um, you know, to reduce that deficit. But I think we're in a position now where the, the the paradigm has totally shifted. Any sort of thoughts on that from from either of you? Uh, I, I'll say something controversial if you like. Right, we love that. Um, you know, I think. Um, one of the great underpinnings of any capitalist society is you actually do need a business cycle. It, it rewards, you, you want entrepreneurs and new people coming in taking risk and you actually need some volatility in order for them to get the right payoff. Um, the, the opposite of that is socialism or crony capitalism, right? And neither of those things are good things. So look, we've had an unusual environment where it's been partly man-made, the, the stress we've put on the economy and the government should step in and support it. But, but there's got to be a point where that steps off. And I don't know whether that's this month or next month or, or next half, but we do need to get back to market forces, you know, doing their thing. And part of those normal market forces and the business cycle is that some businesses fail and other businesses take advantage of that failure and step in. It's the old, um, you know, Joseph Schumpeter for the three economists that might be listening in, you know, that's the creative destruction of, of capitalism. And you want some of that. And it's painful if you're in that left tail and you're the one, you know, feeling it. But at a system level, it's it's incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd wholeheartedly agree with that. So I think I expect over the next 12 months, I'm going to be reporting each month an increase in business defaults and insolvencies. But uh, I think it's important that people don't get spooked by that because, uh, uh, as Jamie said, it's you, you need that signal to, you know, that business are doing the right or wrong thing. So, you know, effectively, I think, you know, a, a good result for me would be seeing, you know, a fa fairly steady increase back to the normal levels of business insolvencies in the economy. Yeah. And, and that's that's got it. That has to come. And it feels like it just keeps getting delayed and understandably getting delayed because, you know, a new variant pops up, whether it's Delta, Omicron, or, um, you know, now we've got floods and, and a, you know, a slower probably recovery than we all expected starting the new year. So, um, you know, we, we my, my, my sort of gut and looking, looking at the data, it kind of feels like, you know, it's probably going to be mid-year, July, August, before we start to see, you know, a return to those normal numbers. But, um, you'll obviously see our monthly our monthly business risk index. It'll get reported on, and it will see you know will show an increase. Um, I think you're right, James. It's we don't want it to be a scary thing that every business is failing. You know we've got to get back to pre-COVID numbers, and arguably it should be it should be above pre-COVID numbers given the stress that a lot of businesses have been through, and um, you know the, the, we know that they're not all going to survive. So um, so yeah, that's a that's a really good point there. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to sort of touch on was um, what, which which industries do we think are you know sort of really primed to to take advantage? And I think I think you know technology businesses we might we might take and put to the side because because that's that that's the obvious one. But you know health health doesn't get sort of spoken. It's not a sexy industry to speak about. You know if you think about the sort of really popular industries to speak about construction or anything property related for obvious reasons in Australia. Um, there's a there's a, a slight obsession there. I think, you know, construction building and then hospitality and retail, you know, what, what are those sort of hidden industries? And James, there's probably a, maybe a few primary industries to, to talk about for you if we, if we start with you. Which, which industries are you sort of expecting to do quite well or continue to do well? Yeah, the ones, um, probably manufacturing, I think might be the, the dark horse. So I actually think that 
COVID's going to cause a rethink of sort of supply chains and, um, you know, security of, of creating your own goods. So I think I, I'm actually expecting manufacturing to, you know, probably in the Western world to some extent, um, probably less less outsourcing and more doing things locally. Um, then the other one is agribusiness, you know, the same sort of thing, having your own sort of food security and, you know, think more sort of self sustainability of, of, of countries. So I think those are the two I'd call out. And then the others I think are, are, are obvious. So the sort of technical and professional services have already done well out of, I think as Jamie explained it well, sort of brought the future forward in some sense in terms of um, better use of technology. And I think they'll, that'll continue into the future yeah. as well. Jamie? Look, um, no crystal ball, and and we probably don't look at it that way. And so I just I just don't have the data um, yeah, so yeah. to look at it on industry level. We look at it much more within each of the industries. There will be there will be winners, and the ones that are winners are the ones that uh, are well set up for this new world that we're in. Um, and it's uh, is that technology pull forward again. So, you know, if you're in retail. Um, if you don't have a really well thought out e-commerce strategy and you don't have a really strong point of difference. You know, this is where business models get exposed, right? If you drive along Parramatta Road at the moment, there's a bunch of windows boarded up. Um, that's e-commerce. That's e-commerce disrupting businesses. And so um, we, we think there's, again, winners and losers in each industry, um, but but those that are well positioned, both for the uncertainty that we think this period, you know, kind of is defined by, but that sort of pull forward of the future, they'll be the ones that win. Yeah, nice one. Very, um, uh, I won't say diplomatic, but yeah, very rational, rational thinking there. I agree. It's, it's got to remember that there's not one industry that will do well. There'll be businesses that win and lose within each industry. Yeah, good point. Um, James, might throw to you and uh, get you to run through some of those BRI numbers that we've seen or that I've had the, the opportunity to see before everyone else um, and well, uh, take, take us right, through that. Given that discussion went on a while, I might give a bit of a shorthand uh, version. Yeah, of great. Slide. Thank you. And, um, and Jamie, if there's any questions that you want to um, throw at James along the way, please uh, please feel free. Yeah, so I summarised some of my key thoughts, but I think we've actually covered all of them in, a, in the discussion. So I might sort of just jump into some of these, some of the facts and figures. Um, so starting with sort of trade receivables. So, you know, we'll take any good news we can. I mean, this month we saw B2B um, trade activity increase, a pretty good jump up in um, February, um, the first sort of good increase for a long time. So um, that's sort of a, a big positive. Look, I'd, I'd say, look, the, the bigger picture is still that we're, you know, we're still down a long way on sort of same time last year and certainly below COVID. So although February's number was good, it's still down, you know, 37% on same time last year. Um, so that's that's one good sign. Um, credit inquiries, um, they have a good jump up in February as well. So I think those two combined are, are sort of saying that, you know, businesses are trading more with each other this month. Um, and then businesses are starting to sort of seek credit as well. So, look, good news, but we're, we're probably a bit muted celebrations given we we do expect that the floods will have a pretty big negative impact sort of roll through sort of next uh, month. Um, in terms of court actions, we reported this last uh, month that sort of court actions are clearly sort of trending up and this month's numbers is, has pretty much reinforced that. So, you know, Increase in sort of court activities is normally a good precursor for insolvencies down the track. So, as and I that's mentioned, almost, that's almost bang on with um, well, it's a, it's close to 2019, and and then obviously not far off 2020 as well, both pre-COVID numbers. And and I think that the banks are starting. You're starting to see some of those roll through in the ATO as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, in terms of the quote return to normal, the, the court actions seem to be the, the stats that sort of getting there first, but the insolvencies will, will follow closely. Um, external administrations, pretty, pretty, um, pretty flat if you compare quarter on quarter, but it's sort of slightly up this month. So probably nothing too 
exciting to see there. But then in terms of what, what we're predicting going forward, sort of our national average um, default rates for, for small businesses, we're no change to our forecast from last month. So we're expecting a pretty steady rise to a little bit over um, pre-COVID levels. So there's some of the, the high level stats. And as I sort of mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of thought into what are these actual numbers actually mean. Again, we feel that sort of reduction in default rates you can see there over the last two years. That's really driven by government sort of propping up businesses. And then sort of over the next sort of 12 months, we expect that to you know, renormalize. Um, with a big caveat that that won't happen in the flood impacted regions, we expect the government and banks to step in and you'll, <laughs> in those regions, you'll, you'll see the same sort of behavior we've seen over the last year or so. Um, in terms of industry, the one, the industry we've been focusing on this month really is construction. Um, and we've talked to quite a bit about it. So here's sort of a view of average default rate by industry based on Creditor Watch's data. Um, so I've sort of highlighted sort of agribusiness and construction there. Agribusiness, um, we'd say that's sort of been a, a, you know, a real sort of great performer over the last sort of two years, um, which we've talked about quite a bit. But in some regions, some farmers will be more affected by the flood. So watch this space um, on them. Um, construction industry, I think the key things are the sort of cost cost and supply chain issues. Um, and of course, ProBuild um, in the media, big collapse, and that's gonna flow on to affect a number of other um, dependent businesses. Um, I'll just jump ahead to something, because um, look, we always talk about the construction industry sort of being a, you know, on average a late payer. And just, just some historic data on, you know, the proportion of construction businesses with late payments and quite severe late payments of 60 days. So we've been reporting over the last few months, sort of, you know, 11, 12% um, sort of arrears rate for the construction industry. Important sort of thing to understand is that's, that's not a, a new development, that's sort of a steady state. So this is sort of five years of data. And you can see over time, yeah, the construction business with payments to our small business data suppliers sort of hovered, always hovered between sort of 11 and 12% arrears. So what's sort of the interesting thing that, that we've seen in the data is that if you look at actual, yeah, you know, you've got late payments, but then you've got defaults. So where a business has gone to the trouble of actually lodging a payment default. So this chart actually shows um, the average number of trade payment um, defaults lodged per year. So for each of our small business data suppliers, and you can see that sort of it peaked just before COVID. So the average one of our data suppliers is lodging about nine defaults per year. Now you see the, the variation in this chart, but um, given a pretty flat actual payment behavior. So what we've actually seen with COVID is the level of lateness to payments to contractors has, has not really changed, but the kind of willingness to lodge a default has decreased. Um, so again, that's that sort of, you know, we think that's an artificial effect of the, what's going on with, with previously with COVID, but now also with other factors like floods. Um, the big question for us is will the behaviour of creditors change over the next year or so? So I ex expect, particularly with some of the, the media, I actually expect, um, you know, the probably um, suppliers to the construction industry will be more readily willing to, to lodge defaults for, for late payments. Look, they're, they're the, I guess, the key things. And just to finally sort of touch on the floods, um, you know, we report the business risk index, which is a, a, essentially a ranking of insolvency risk by regions in Australia. Now, yeah, the floods are a new thing uh, that will actually obviously affect these numbers. So you can sort of see New South Wales there. We've sort of highlighted the, the areas that are affected by floods. And what you can actually, some of them were, were regions like, um, yeah, Richmond Valley, for example. Um, yeah, that's a region that was actually performing very well. Um, and then of course, that's, that region contains Lismore. So the regions that were performing quite well and now been inundated. So we'll be watching the data, but we actually don't expect to see those insolvencies pick up. So I think the data will be a bit distorted on those regions for probably about 12 months. Look, I think there's sort of some of the key findings that there's Queensland as well. So just to highlight sort of, it, it sort of cuts across the spectrum both regions that were previously high, medium or low risk are all sort of affected by the 
floods on the, the eastern seaboard. So we'll be watching that closely. And um, yeah, look, I, I think I'll finish there and sort of open back up for further discussion. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, James. And just to everyone who's um, who's listening in as well, there's the, the questions box if you did um, if you did want to ask questions. And, and we, we do have one here, which James, I might throw to you first is in the um, there's obviously good good liquidity has been spoken about, but in the construction industry, there are many clients waiting to be paid um, by big builders. Um, you know, what, what do you see the reason for the delay in payment to SMEs? Yeah, so I think there's lots of ways you could answer that. So there definitely is a culture of delayed payments in, yeah, compared to any other industry, uh, suppliers and subcontractors in construction just get paid slower. It's actually a tricky thing for, for small businesses to monitor credit risk, because if I'm in another industry, if I see a, a, a you know a business that's regularly paying say 30 days late, that's a big red warning flag, and I'll probably put some controls in or or take an action of some kind. Whereas where it's tricky with con construction is, you know, if you look at sort of pro build, you know, if you see a big construction firm with sort of 30 day late payments, you probably think, oh, well, they're just pushing around their <laughs> their suppliers more more or less. Um, so I think what you've got to be I think what what you saw we saw in that case is the signal was really that the payment times started to blow out. So they were always paying late, but then we sort of we were progressively downgrading their payment behaviour. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. It is a tricky one, but I just wonder if some of these, you know, some of what what's been going on in the media will actually change the way you know some credit providers sort of react to that that sort of slow payment. Yeah, that's that. You make a good point. It's the change in behaviour, isn't it? That's that's the um, the key the key part. If they're consistently paying late, at least they're paying. Whereas if they're uh, if we're seeing a change from, you know, being late to being very late, well, then that's certainly a, a real big red flag there as well. So um, to answer the question more directly, I think the the question was sort of what what is the reason. The tricky thing is reasons. it can there, <laughs> there can be different reasons. It can either be that there's liquidity issues and the, the company's in trouble or they're managing their working capital and just pushing you around <laughs> and yeah. it can be difficult to tell which is which. <laughs> yeah. and, and I would agree with that, James. I think particularly particularly in civil construction, particularly where um, we're talking about the subcontractors to quite large builders, as you point out, it's cultural and where you get a little bit of stress in the industry those payments then get you know, pushed out even further. Um, we tend to see it, it, it's still an issue, but we, we tend to see it less in other parts of the construction uh, industry. So for example, just in the general um, tradie market, you know, dealing with residential construction, things like that, the payment terms we see at least in our data, you know, tend to be, tend to be a little bit better. Yeah, and the other, the other dimension here is they're not paying their banks late. <laughs> So they're they're not paying their bank loans one day late. So it's sort of a it's an interesting thing. Sort of as someone who sort of sees both sides, it was actually quite an eye opener. Sort of how late sort of construction industry plays their suppliers versus their you know banks and creditors. Yeah, yeah, very good point. So I think look, my my take from that obviously some of those key credit risk indicators are obviously up. You know, payment defaults, um, court actions, external administrations. Um, we usually see a jump from Jan to Feb for, for obvious reasons, but we're starting to see, you know, that movement back to, you know, or at least heading towards pre-COVID levels, which I think, as Jamie mentioned, is is healthy. And there's that quote that I keep pinching from uh, from John Winter, but he's he's also pinched it from from somewhere else. So I'll have to find out who the original author of it is. But um, capitalism without insolvency is like Catholicism without hell. You have to have it, so um, you know we need to we need to be moving back there. And unfortunately, you know companies need to be allowed to fail. And and we've obviously got a lot of the a lot of the the things that were keeping them upright, which was you know JobKeeper and the insolvency protections are, are, are long gone. It's now a um, a bit of a you know a long tail as we as we wean off that um wean off that drug that that kept a lot of businesses um, floating. It also just takes time for them to filter through such as the insolvency process. It's, uh, there's a lot of rigor and um, red tape and legislation that, 
that goes into it. And it's easy for, for businesses to take advantage of uh, supplier sympathy as well in, uh, in, in times, of, uh, times of tough trade, whether it's pandemic or uh, you know, natural disaster related. Um, and, it, and the other thing I always say is, you know, one month doesn't make a trend. So you've got to hang out for, 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 for uh, March and March and April. Um, and March, as I always find, is a very good indicative month of, of how the economy is going because you've got through that slow December jam period. Feb's are, you know, putting my sales hat on uh, 28 days in, in the month, um, which means, you know, technically sales managers should probably be dropping, uh, you know, targets for that particular month that they never do. And then uh, March, you know, you get back into it before April school holidays and, uh, and Easter comes along. So I think March is, is a, always a good indicator. Um, I'm conscious of time here. Um, gents, did you have any sort of final words that, that you wanted to mention or, or anything um, to, to summarise what, what we've seen? We've done, we've done plenty of summarising, so no pressure. Can, can I ask a quick question of James? Yeah. Just, just James, you, you mentioned the ATO early on. Um, how big a influence are they on the insolvency numbers? And if you've got insight, how, how do you see them kind of behaving in, in the current period? Yeah, so the answer to the first question is a very big influence. So essentially the biggest creditor in in many respects. So, so yes, a part of that big decline in the default rates really is the ATO not enforcing tax debts. And Look, I don't have any as many insiders into the ATO, but I, I am aware that there there are plans to kind of get back to normal. There's, there's been public statements to that effect. So I think the tax office starting to chase tax arrears will be a put up pressure on insolvencies. And just on that, they've they've obviously introduced fairly recently the ability to register defaults as a as an a, ATO can register them. So. Um, the introduction of that scheme and, and actually the sending of letters to uh, those debtors who have sort of avoided um, engaging with the ATO has actually seen a really a, a really good um, increase in, in either interaction or payment as well. So that's a that's a good sign as a um, as a taxpayer. Um, we'd obviously love to get we, we will get our hands on that data as those defaults are registered, but to date. Have actually been um, getting paid, which is which is really positive. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, I read, you know, that the numbers of ATO wind ups are, you know, are at their lowest level ever. Um, so this, they, they certainly make up a big proportion. I might get that stat, but I'm pretty sure it ends up being sort of 30 or 40 percent of all wind ups and ultimately administration. So they're they're a huge, huge, uh, huge. We know they're the biggest creditor, but they're they're a big um, mover of that of that figure. Um, I've just got one more question. Uh, I, don't, I think we've addressed that one. All right, I'll I'll um, I'll leave it there unless Jamie, James, you had any sort of final thoughts or words to uh, to add? No, not from me, Patrick. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Great to have you both on board and I, I look forward to sort of seeing more numbers and, and of course, doing more webinars in the future. So thank you, Jamie, thank you, James, and of course, Everyone, um, either at home or, or, or if you're back in the office, as I am, which is nice. Um, thanks for your time. Appreciate it as always. Jump onto creditorwatch.com.au to have a look at that Outlook 2022. Um, the uh, the marketing team at Creditor Watch have done a phenomenal job, as have the uh, contributors to that, of which James and Jamie um, contributed. So thank you again, gents, and thank you to everyone. Stay safe out there, and we will see you very soon. Thank you, everyone.